Grace, mercy, and peace be upon you from God our Father and our Lord and our Savior Jesus. Amen? All right, friends, this isn't going to be news to you, but it's Labor Day weekend. Tomorrow is Labor Day, a day when we celebrate work by not doing any. I love that, actually. We celebrate work by not doing any. Well, uh, most of us won't do any. There are some of us who will be working tomorrow. And so for those of us who will be working, serving the community when, quote, everyone has the day off, can we just say thank you for working tomorrow? You know, Labor Day, Labor Day is a holiday that celebrates what? Work, yes. I know, that wasn't rhetorical. I was actually asking, right? It is to celebrate work and the fruit, actually the fruit of people's labor. Uh, Labor Day was first celebrated in New York City in 1882 when the Central Labor Union of New York organized a parade of thousands of union members from across varied trades that culminated ultimately in a picnic for those members and their families. And then in 1894, so 12 years later, President Cleveland signs a law officially making it a federal holiday. And to this day, it continues then to be a holiday celebrating labor and the fruit of our labor. You know, work, work is a good thing. In fact, work is a holy thing, though in a lot of the conversations that I have with people, they would rarely describe their work as good, right? Work, work isn't good, they'd say. Like, pastor, work is, you know, work. And they don't mean it's joyful. They mean it's actually labor. For lots of people, work isn't good, and it certainly isn't holy. And so this celebration of work, it is a, a civil holiday, no doubt, but the, the question follows for those of us who are trying to follow Jesus, who are orienting our lives around his words and his ways, who are growing in the likeness of Christ— How are we supposed to approach work? What is the nature of work? Is it good? Is it holy? Or maybe a bit more subtly, is is some work more holy than other kinds of work? And finally, is work ever joyful? Now, when I was a freshman in college, my dad won an office lottery. And as luck would have it, it was two seats at the United Center in Chicago to watch the Chicago Bulls, complete with a suite at the downtown Hyatt. And my dad on the phone wanted to know if I wanted to go, to go and watch the likes of Scottie Pippen and Dennis Rodman and John Paxton. This was the Bulls in their prime. There was 95 and Michael Jordan wasn't playing, but I'm not bitter. Nevertheless, I was in. Like, let's go. So we flew to Chicago, landed in Chicago midway, took a taxi into the city, into the Hyatt, ultimately to drop off all of our gear. We went to our room. We marveled at the Chicago skyline. And then we promptly walked to Giordano's East, where we ate an entire Chicago-style pie, just the two of us. And then after the pie coma... We walked then down to the United Center, and once inside, we caught our breath as we took in the sights and the sounds of a professional basketball game with a team at the height of its fame. Now, some of you, some of you know that I was raised in Denver, Colorado. You're saying, well, you guys had a professional team. Well, when I was growing up, the Denver Nuggets were not professional. They were professional, but they were awful. They were like the farm team for the rest of the NBA, right? So, so to go to Chicago and to watch the Bulls in their prime, once in a lifetime opportunity. And so there we were inside the United Center with our breath just being held. My dad was asking Usher like the best way to get to our seats. And I remember the Usher looking at us with a, with a certain level of pity, but, but also with a little bit of awe. And I, I know my dad sort of caught all of those nonverbal bits of communication. He's like, I know, I know, we're not, we're not from here. Uh, we, we just don't know the best way to our seats. And the Usher, the Usher says, oh, your seats are really easy to find. 
You see those folding chairs right down there on the wood alongside the court? Those are yours. Now, I, I know it's hard to believe, but my dad and I didn't realize that we had courtside seats at the Chicago Bulls game at the United Center. Now, friends, when, when we got to the seats, these folding chairs, but with really nice padding, right? When you got to the seats, there were menus placed on the seats. And not long after that, a server came and asked what it is we wanted. My dad, being the fr frugal businessman that he was, he started talking about cost as I'm watching in awe, like Dennis Rodman in all of his tie-dye hair glory, right? Trying to warm up. Now, this is crazy. Turns out that if you're sitting in those folding chairs with the nice pads, the food is free. Now, I don't know if it's still the same, but believe you me, my dad and I took every bit of advantage of everything that they were going to bring to us. I swear, we probably ordered everything off of the menu, and they gladly brought it to us. Unfortunately for my dad, beer was not free, but the food was, and we took it all. Now, the, the highlight, honestly, for me of the day was not just being there at the United Center or the pizza or even all the food they kept bringing to our seats. It was the third quarter in the third quarter, John Paxton dove for a ball out of bounds, and he landed at my feet. And as he got up, I did what every college-age basketball-loving kid would do. I gave him the proverbial slap on the tush and told him, good job. Yeah, dog, that's right, because I'm cool like that. <laughs> When I look back on it, it probably wasn't the best, but in the moment, right, I was in, right? I was like, we going, you know, I'm here. It was, uh, it was really just an amazing opportunity. As, as my dad and I rode back to the hotel, I thought, about, I thought about how different our experience would have been had we sat somewhere else in the building. Because at the time, it felt like those that were closest to the game, those sitting in the folding chairs courtside, were having the best experience. There are clearly levels of demarcation. There is a line between those where servers bring them food and those who are going to wait in a 10-minute line for nachos that are both stale and overpriced. A line between those who are literally courtside watching the real thing, hearing the squeak of the sneakers, and those who are sitting so far up, they're watching the real thing but on a TV screen. A TV screen, by the way, they could watch in their own home with their own bathroom with food that is neither stale nor overpriced. There are just levels of demarcation inside of the building. And there is an assumption, and the assumption is this, that those seats nearest the court have the most value, and because they have the most value, they therefore have the most joy. Now, whether we know it or not, this kind of thinking has seeped its way into the church. It is subtle, and it's sometimes below the surface, but there is a kind of thinking that is detrimental to the expansion of God's kingdom on earth. The thinking is this, that there are some kinds of work that are better than others. There are some kinds of work that are more God-pleasing than others. There are some kinds of work that are more holy than others. There are some kinds of work that if you have the right kind of work, then, then you're going to sit courtside. But if you have that other kind of work, then you're sitting in the nosebleeds. And there is, interestingly, a slight derivative as well. In order for my work to be God-pleasing, that it needs to be overtly Christian. Or maybe just a work at the church on Sunday. You know, there's, there's some wonderful Martin Luther folklore, and I say folklore because the exchange of this conversation is not written in any of Martin Luther's works, but the story goes like this. Martin Luther was approached by a working man who wanted to know how it is he could serve the Lord. And so Luther asked him, what is your work right now? The man replies, well, I'm a shoemaker. And much to the cobbler's surprise, Luther's reply is this, then make a good shoe. It's interesting, Luther didn't say, make Christian shoes. And he didn't say, uh, you should sell the shoes and be a monk. 
All he says is, if you want to serve the Lord by what you do, just make good shoes. And friends, th this actually is the key for us to understand the nature of work. And it's rooted in Paul's letter to the Christians at Rome that we heard Tom read just moments ago. So let's grab a Bible together. We're going to go to Romans chapter 12, verse 1. There's Bibles in the pew. They're in front of you. They may be under the seats if you're up front or in the sides of the chairs. You can paper, digital, doesn't matter. Romans chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. Romans chapter 12, uh, beginning at verse 1. Now, as you're getting there, Romans, the book of Romans, is by and large St. Paul's most dogmatic book. It dives deep into the themes of sin, judgment, justification by grace, what it means to be the remnant of Israel, and what it means to have a sanctified life. And when we get, finally, when we get to Romans chapter 12, St. Paul begins to address what it means to live in response to the scandal of God's grace. What does it mean to live in response to the scandal of God's grace? So here we are, Romans chapter 12, beginning right at verse 1. Paul writes, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. So we're going to pause here. P Paul is going to urge us to a kind of behaving. He's going to urge us to a kind of behaving, but it's going to be in view of God's mercy. Again, if we had read the rest of Romans, we would read that we are dead in our sin, much like we said at the baptism this morning, and that by God's work in Christ Jesus, his life, death, resurrection, and ascension, because of that work, we've been moved from death to life. That's God's mercy. And so Paul's going to urge us to a kind of behavior in view of what God has already done for us. So he goes on. He says, this is the behavior now, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. In other words, St. Paul is going to urge us to give everything we are, body, soul, mind, and spirit. We're going to give everything back to God. In view of what God has done for us, we're going to give him everything. We're going to give it back to him. And when we do, Paul says, that'll be worship. So he goes on, verse 2, do not conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. In other words, you're going to give your whole self back to God. And you're going to do it in a way that is different than the culture. Do not be conformed to the culture, St. Paul says. Don't give yourself to your work in the same way the culture does, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Give yourself differently. Be motivated by something else. Uh, there's a pastor here in the States, Pastor Tolian. Uh, he wrote an article in Christianity Today about five years ago, and in it, he's trying to wrestle with really these two verses of Romans chapter 12. Uh, here's what he writes in that article of Christianity Today. He says, as Christians, we can serve God in a variety of vocation, and we don't need to justify that work, whatever it is, in terms of its spiritual value or evangelistic usefulness. We simply exercise whatever our calling is with new God-glorifying motives and goals and standards. Now listen to this. He says, outwardly, outwardly, there may be no discernible difference between a non-Christian's work and that of a Christian. And pause there. Because that's, that's key. He's saying, outwardly, there is no discernible difference between a non-Christian's work and a Christian's work. The difference, he says, the difference is found in the motive and the goal and the standard. Said another way, Christian work is work that begins in the heart. 
It is work given to God for His glory. It is a work that we offer back all the gifts and skills that He's first given us. God glorifying work is a work that is given back to God as an offering. And so there's not a better kind of work than another. So it doesn't matter actually if you're a bus driver or a plumber or an accountant or a student or a businesswoman or an entomologist or even an evolutionary biologist, whether you're a first responder, a nurse, or a shift worker, none of them are better than the other. Each work, when given back to God fully, when offered to Him as an offering, it is God glorifying, and it is beautiful. In other words, in the Christian work realm, there really is no difference between courtside seats and nosebleed seats. We are all present at the game. But let's pick up with Paul here in Romans chapter 12, verse 4. We're going to move down to verse 4. Paul says, For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, we form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We, listen, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. And so if your gift is prophesying, then prophesy. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teach, then teach. If it's encourage, then encourage. If it's give, then give. If it's to lead, then lead. If it's to show mercy, then show mercy. I mean, Paul might as well say if it's to plumb, then plumb. Whatever your gift is, it is a beautiful gift and God glorifying when we offer it back to God. If we think about the disciples for a hot second, I mean, we certainly know that some of them are fishermen, right? We know one is a tax collector. We don't, we don't really know the vocations of the disciples, the rest of the disciples. So I, I love, actually, those of you who are uh, watching The Chosen, I love what they're doing. They're giving vocations to the disciples. Some of them are great. There's an architect, right? There's a disciple who builds things. There's one who's a sommelier. I don't know how you got that job, but I'm for tasting wine. Like that, that's me. Right? I want to bring that to the Lord and all the God-given glory I've got. I'm just saying, we all have these different gifts. It was true with the disciples. It was true with the disciples. Those gifts are beautiful, beautiful and God-glorifying when we offer them back to Him. Now, no doubt there's different skills and gifts, but the question still remains. We can know that, but does that make work joyful? (laughs) Does that make work fun? (sighs) To get at why work is often not fun, Uh, We have to go back to the very beginning of the Scriptures, all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, really beginning probably around verse 26-ish or so. Uh, Here's what Moses writes. He says, God said, let us make mankind in our image. Let us make mankind in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds of the sky, the livestock, the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Now, there's a lot of things happening in this one verse, but for the sake of time, I'm going to try to boil it down to two things. The first one is this. God makes humanity, male and female, to be His image or to be His icon on the earth. In other words, there's something about humans, male and female, there's something unique to them as embodied beings in order to be God's image on the earth. And as God's image, then, this is the second thing, male and female are to rule over the fish, the birds, the livestock, wild animals, and the creatures. If you go to chapter 2 of Genesis, kind of the expanded version of the creation story, it says this, God says, you're going to work or take care of the garden. So let me recap really briefly. God created humans, male and female, to be his image in the world, to embody him in the world, to be a physical representation of God on the earth, and to work. (laughs) 
That's what he did in Genesis chapter 1. God created us to work before the fall into sin. In other words, working is a part of the perfection. It's a part of the perfected creation. So said in another way, work is good. It's holy. Why isn't it joyful? The reason it's a pain in your foot is that work now comes after the fall of humanity into sin. We read in Genesis chapter 3, cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat your food from it all the days of your life. The ground will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. And by the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. In other words, let me, let me, let me put this in like Pastor Brian translation. In other words, work is going to be hard, and you're going to do it until you die. Like, thanks, Adam and Eve, right? That's what we get from them, that work, though it was designed to be good and holy and even joyful, it is now a pain in our foot because of sin. It's hard. But even though it's hard, it doesn't change the fact that God made it to be good and holy, and that if we are humans, we are designed to work to offer back our gifts and our skills to God, to offer him all of ourselves as an act of worship. And that work, that work is good. You see, the difference between the work before the fall into sin and the work after the fall into sin is work that is done in the presence of God. You know, I've, I've, I've often reflected on that experience at the United Center in the Chicago Bulls, uh, thinking about the joy of that experience, of sitting courtside, of hearing sneakers squeak, of tapping John Paxton, saying good job, of all the food <laughs> that we ate that day. But here's what I've realized over time. The thing that makes that experience joyful is not courtside seats. The thing that makes that thing joyful is not the amount of food that we ate. It's not the squeak of the sneakers. It's not even John Paxton at my feet. The thing that makes that experience joyful is that I got to do it in the presence of my dad. That's what made it joyful. We could watch it courtside. We could watch it in the nosebleeds. We could watch it on a small little TV screen in the hallway as we waited for nachos that are stale and overpriced. But if I get to do it in the presence of my dad, it's joyful. So too, when we offer our gifts and our skills in our varied vocations, so whether you're a teacher, or a lawyer, or a doctor, or a businesswoman, or a plumber, or a student, or a pastor, or you work out of the house, it doesn't matter. Each of those works, when given back to God, are beautiful, and we do them in the presence of our Father. And that, that's what brings joy to our work, that we get to do it shoulder to shoulder with the one who created, the one who redeemed, the one who sustains us. Friends, I'm, I'm prayerful that tomorrow when we get to Labor Day and we celebrate work by not doing any, I pray that tomorrow we'd be mindful that the skills and the gifts and the talents that we bring as we offer them back to God, are beautiful and God-pleasing, and that there is joy in our work when we do it in the presence of our Father. To God be the glory. Amen? Amen. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, may guard and keep our hearts in Christ Jesus today 
and every day. Amen.